Good morning. That's a good good morning, yes. It's good to be with you again and to be able to share and worship as we lift up the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and worship him and him alone. I invite you to stand for the call to worship. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Let us offer up our praise to God. Whenever I think of that phrase, standing in awe, my mind goes to the book of Revelation. What a beautiful picture there as John is on the island of Patmos and he sees this vision of the Lord Jesus Christ seated high upon the throne and he bows down in worship in awe of him. And then he offers this benediction, actually it's a greeting at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. Amen. Let us continue to lift up our praise to the Lord.
seated. We certainly gather together as a people of common faith. And what a joy it is and a privilege to be able to profess that faith together through one of the ancient creeds of the Church, the Apostles' Creed. Let us share that creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us, claiming that faith, come before our Father in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty, everlasting God, in the peace and silence of this sanctuary, we come to you through Jesus Christ alone. We give you thanks that we are here together at this moment in time. We thank you for the privilege of being able to come to you knowing that you hear us and you answer us because you love us. And that is so important because when we awaken each morning, it's, it's hard to hear much good news. We're bombarded with wars and rumors of war, with terror, troubles and turmoil at home and throughout the world, kidnappings, evil plots. And we awaken each day to incivility, to the sounds of leaders, neighbors, and sometimes even family sniping and shouting at one another confronted with relative truth and rejection of and hatred for your truth. And we admit that sometimes we're tempted to believe that evil is winning and we're losing the battle and we easily become overwhelmed. But now, being here, together in your sanctuary, refocuses us. It gives us a renewed perspective, your perspective. Here we remember with the psalmist that things are not always what they seem, that the present state of affairs is not permanent, that though the wrong seems off so strong, God, you are the ruler yet. Remember again that you are faithful, that things are as you say they are, and your promises are guaranteed because at Calvary you won the battle, you were seated on the throne, and you reign forever and forever. So reignite us this morning with the assurance that no matter what, we are always with you. You hold us, and you will never let us go. Even, even if we lose our grip on you, you never lose your grip of us and will guide us into glory. May we catch a glimpse of that glory here this morning. And in the meantime, until that day, we ask for you to help us as we look to Jesus, the pioneer of our faith. Grant your blessing and strength to those who are in need of a healing touch. Usher forth your healing. Grant them your presence. Grant them perseverance. Bring comfort to those who are walking through the valley of mourning, through the shadow of death. May they feel you as the great shepherd. May they feel your heart is the heart of comfort and peace. Grant your peace and patience to those who engage daily in loving caregiving. Grant them strength for each day. We pray for Pastor Simon and his family and ask that you will renew and refresh them in this time away. And now as we give of our tithes and offerings, we thank you for supplying them to us and for multiplying them as they are distributed in the name and the power of Jesus Christ our Lord, all so that others may come to see your glory. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. It is now our privilege 
to give our tithes and offerings to our Lord. Yes, we do so in one sense out of obedience. Let us do it more so lovingly in response to his grace and love for us. Let us give our offerings and our tithes. Oh, okay. That's why nobody came forward. (laughs) Then let's turn to the scripture for the morning. Two passages. First from Isaiah, the 35th chapter. We'll read it in its entirety, and then we'll also go to what I think is a corollary passage in the first chapter of John. But let's go first to Isaiah, chapter 35. Let us hear the word of our Lord. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. And then from the first chapter of John, reading verses 14 through 18. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord God, we have read your word. Now help us understand. Apply it to our hearts. For we claim the promise of your word that it never goes forth void, but always accomplishes the purpose for which you send it out. Do so now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you enjoy receiving gifts? How many of you enjoy giving gifts? Now, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but... I'm wondering how many of you enjoy giving gifts more than receiving gifts. Because we all know someone who enjoys giving gifts. God. In fact, he gives gifts galore. But his greatest gift was announced through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah announced that a special gift was coming to the nation of Israel. Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come to save you. What a promise that must have been for them. God himself would be present with them and would bring them gifts galore. I mean, in reality, most often the greatest gift is the presence of someone who loves us, is it not? 
couple of years ago, my wife and I made the decision to move from South Haven, where, we had, where I had retired out and where we had lived for 17 years, and moved towards Grand Rapids up in the Byron Center area to be near one of our sons and our grandkids. And so, as is always the case, just before we moved, on our final weekend there, we had this huge garage sale, this moving sale. And on the second day on that Saturday, just as we were ready to begin, our son from Texas walked up the driveway and said hello, surprised us with his presence, and stayed with us for the entire first week of our transition. That was one of the greatest blessings that he had ever been able to give to us, the gift of his presence at such an important time. And you know that feeling. That's why family gatherings are so important to each of us. Well, what the prophet Isaiah prophesied, in fact, came true in a surprising way. Through a baby born of a virgin in a manger. And he came bearing gifts. That's what John said. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth, and out of that fullness we have all received grace in place of grace. Some translations say grace upon grace. The phrase means grace piled upon grace, continuous grace with no interruptions, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing, favor upon favor, gift upon gift, gifts galore from Jesus Christ. Jesus' presence is the present. And Isaiah told the Israelites what gifts Jesus would bring and how his presence among these people would impact their lives. And so we look at those four gifts listed in Isaiah this morning. First, when he comes, God gives glory to the barren. First two verses of that 35th chapter. The wilderness and dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus that shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given. Remember now, this is to the desert. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. The, the desert symbolized the dry, barren times of life. It was a place of, of wandering, death, despair, struggle, hard times. It meant disappointment and diminished power for living. And for Israel, it had been two generations of captivity in the enemy's territory. And their homeland was 500 miles away, through the desert and on the other side of the mountains, on roads filled with danger. So Isaiah's promise is God will bring life where there is no life. God will bring life where life seems impossible. That's what God does. Brings life where life seems impossible. I remember many years ago when the nation of Biafra was suffering tremendously and the Red Cross was gathering supplies and medicine and clothing and the like for them. A report came out that inside one of the boxes at their collection center there was a letter. And when they opened the letter, it read, We have recently been converted, and because of our conversion, we want to try to help. We won't ever need these again. Can you use them for something? And inside the box were several sheets from the Ku Klux Klan. And those sheets were cut into strips and used to help heal the wounds of black persons in Africa. God will bring life where life seems impossible. Because when God enters the human situation, the barren will see the glory of the Lord. And glory really means a sense of majesty, but it means weighty, influential, massive respect. We will experience the weight of his influence when he comes. When Jesus comes, we experience the weight of his glory and majesty. So no matter what, if you're backslidden, if you're suffering from spiritual dry rot, or wrestling with overwhelming temptation, or enduring stifling trials or reeling from some kind of pressure or burdened down with horrific grief, no matter what, the promise is that in the dark, deadly desert in which you live, God will come and there will be life and glory of the Lord. God will bring life where life seems impossible. He'll bring glory to the barren. Gift number two, God will come to save the fearful 
Israel, being in dire straits, was tired, fatigued, beginning to fear that they would, in fact, never get back to their homeland again. And so God's message through Isaiah is, Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, do not fear. And what's interesting about this is the word in Hebrew for fear really means hasty. And I like that because when we become fearful, what do we do? We make hasty and often poor decisions about our circumstances. When the pressure rises too high, when the stress winds us up too tight, we jump to conclusions. And it's then we begin to ask questions like, does God still love me? Have I let God down? Is God trying to punish me? Can I handle anything more? Can I make it through? If anything more happens to me, if I face any other temptation, if any more adversity overwhelms me, I don't think I can make it through. And here's the answer. Here is your God. He will come. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. God is saying that He will come and save us from anything that separates us from Himself. He will take vengeance on and destroy anything that is separating us from Him. And then He will turn and save us. So the reality of life is deserts are really breeding grounds for gardens. Despair is the seedbed for expectation. Sin is the platform for forgiveness. Sadness is the prelude for joy. Turmoil is the birth of hope. And death is but the womb of life. And we can count on it because God doesn't come to us because we're worth coming to, but because he loves us. In the manger, he came to share his love. In his resurrection and ascension, he rose to share his love. And as Paul says, nothing, nothing can separate us from his love. Jesus did it all for love. Three days before Christmas, a young mother was busy getting things ready for the big day, and to occupy her young seven-year-old son, she asked if he would polish her shoes. And so he did, and a short time later he came and presented her shoes, and she looked at them, and he had done such a beautiful job. She was so proud, she, she gave him a quarter for his efforts. Christmas Day, she went to put the shoes on, and she noticed in the toe of one of the shoes there was something crumpled up, and so she reached in and pulled it out, and There was a crumpled piece of paper. She opened it up, and there was a note on the paper, and there was the quarter, and the note said, I done it for love. God came in Jesus. Jesus did it for love. So no matter what our fear, God still comes out of love to save us because he loves us. God gives glory to the barren, saves the fearful, And the third gift is he gives wholeness to the broken. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the speechless sing for joy, water shall break forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert, burning sand shall become a pool, thirsty ground, springs of water, the haunt of jackals shall become a swamp, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. What they'll see in the desert will not be a mirage, it will be a miracle. And just consider the ministry of Jesus. Time after time, he said to people whom he had healed, your faith has made you well. It has healed you. It has made you whole. And remember when the disciples of John the Baptist were asked by John the Baptist, go and ask Jesus if he is truly the promised one, the son, the Messiah. And they went to Jesus and they said, John wants to know, are are you the promised one? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus said, go and tell John what you see and hear and experience that the blind people can see, that lame people can walk, that the lepers are cured, that the deaf can hear, that the dead are raised. Tell John that when people come into contact with me, there's wholeness in life. Indeed, no matter what our situation, no matter what the illness, no matter what the struggles, no matter what the doubts, God will make us whole when we come to him.
So I wonder, what is your need this morning? Is there some brokenness in your life? Some lack of wholeness? Let's frame it this way. If Jesus came to you this morning and said, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say? Would you give him your broken heart? Your decaying body? Your destructive attitude? Your haunting loneliness? Your raging bitterness? Your piercing grief? Your stubborn, unforgiving spirit? What would you say this morning in answer to Jesus? Remember, by his stripes, we are healed. God gives gifts to the barren, the fearful, the broken. And fourthly, God replaces rocky roads with peaceful pathways. Back in Isaiah, 35th chapter, verse 8, a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. It's only fitting that this final scene should symbolize traveling because we are on a journey of life. We are traveling this journey. And what we see before us, according to Isaiah, is a pathway of peace. We're traveling God's interstate. It's not like Michigan roads. There's no detours. There's no construction. There's no road rage. There's no potholes. There's no wrong way drivers. There's no lane cutters. All the traffic is going same speed to the same direction, to the same end. It's the road upon which he invites us to walk each day. It's called the holy way, the way of peace. But only the redeemed will walk there and the ransomed of the Lord will return. Again, think about Jesus. All throughout his life, turmoil surrounded him, and Jesus brought peace. Remember in the boat, Jesus had fallen asleep, the storm arose, the disciples began to fear and panic, they woke him up, and all Jesus said was, Peace, be still. And there was calm, reminding us that when Jesus is on board, the boat will always arrive at the other shore. And on the night before his betrayal and his crucifixion, knowing what lay ahead, still he turned to his disciples and ministered to them, and he said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. And after his resurrection, Jesus' most favorite greeting was, Peace, peace be unto you. Jesus is the way from barrenness to glory, from fear to saving, from brokenness to wholeness, from rocky roads to peaceful pathways. And the guarantee here is when we walk this road, we will make it home. The final verse in Isaiah 35. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. Sorrow and sighing will flee away. Sounds of singing, shouting, laughter, joy. Everyone filled with joy. And there's only one end of the road and it's Jesus himself. Jesus is not only the new and living way. He is the end of the way. We are reminded that life begins and ends with Jesus. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us to bring us safely home at last. Remember his precious words in the 14th chapter of John where he also spoke those words of peace. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And then these words from Revelation, the 21st chapter, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. 
He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We will make it safely home. Whatever your rocky road Whatever tends to unnerve you, that which makes you restless, that which causes you fear, whatever it is that stirs up your worry, we can bring it to the table and we can bring it to Jesus and find rest and peace. Perhaps the best way to put it is simply this. There is nothing you are facing at this moment or at any moment that you cannot bring to God. For he is present. He's with you. There was a little boy riding across town on a city bus. He was huddled very close to a well-dressed lady and was swinging his legs back and forth in the aisle as a young child might do. And Accidentally, his shoes bumped the lady sitting across the aisle. She piped up and said, Pardon me, ma'am, but would you tell your little boy to keep his feet to himself? And the woman said, he, he's not my boy. I've never seen him before. Now embarrassed, the little boy moved to another seat and sank down as if to hide and fighting back tears said, I, I'm sorry, ma'am, I, I, I didn't mean to. And when the woman saw how her reprimand had, had hurt him, she said, oh, that's all right. Are you going somewhere alone? The boy said softly, I always travel alone. My mom and daddy are dead, and I live with my Aunt Maggie. But when she gets tired of me, she sends me to my Aunt Elizabeth. The woman said, is that where you're going today, to see your Aunt Elizabeth? He said, yes, but she's hardly ever home. I hope she's home today, though, because it sure is cold out. The woman continued and said, you're sure awfully young to be riding the bus alone. The boy said, oh, well, that, that's okay. I, I never get lost, but sometimes I get so awful lonesome. So when I see someone I'd like to belong to, I simply get real close to them and pretend they're my family. That's what I was doing when I kicked you. I, I, I just forgot about my feet. Hearing that, the lady moved out of her seat and sat next to him, put her arm around him, and hugged him close. She knew that all he ever wanted was to belong to someone. Today, the message is we belong to someone. We belong to Jesus. And we come to his table, and he can love us and hold us close. And he will because we belong to him. Years ago, vocalist Edie framed it beautifully in a song. The words were, Are you tired of chasing pretty rainbows? Are you tired of spinning round and round? Wrap up all the shattered dreams of your life and at the feet of Jesus, lay them down. Give them all. Give them all. Give them all to Jesus. Shattered dreams, wounded hearts, broken toys. Give them all. Give them all. Give them all to Jesus and he will turn your sorrow into joy. Give them all to Jesus. At the feet of Jesus, lay them down. Let us do that this day. Let's pray. Father God, we are so overwhelmed by your grace upon grace, by your gifts galore. Thank you. Thank you that even now you are ready to give us the gifts of your presence to replace anything and everything that keeps us from your love. There may be some who need to open their hands and hearts to you so you can fill them. Holy Spirit, prompt them to do it. Perhaps some are wavering in their belief and need to put more trust in you. Holy Spirit, prompt them to do it. Some may need to take that 
that final step and say, Lord, I believe, Holy Spirit, move in their hearts. And maybe some just need to pause from the busyness of life, take a deep breath, and let you refuel them with your love. Holy Spirit, prompt them to do it. Now, Jesus, in these moments, we bring you all our barrenness, our fear, our brokenness, our rocky roads, our need for your closeness. Gift us with your healing, renewing, empowering presence so we can go forth with singing, with everlasting joy crowning our heads. May gladness and joy overtake us and sorrow and sighing flee away. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and give praise to this great Lord of ours through this him, our great Savior.
Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper which we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with this same Christ, who's promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us to life eternal. And in the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. And we come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom is fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body. So are we to receive the supper in true love, mindful of the communion of all of the saints. Let's pray. Holy and right it is in our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God, you created heaven with all its hosts, the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and we bless you, O God. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper that perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. And we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. So spend your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, with the bread which we break, and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up into all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me.
the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Eat of it. In the same manner also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which you bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. You, 
As our prayer of thanksgiving, let us hear the words of the psalmist. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, and would also give us all things with him. Therefore shall my mouth and heart show forth the praise of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. I invite you to stand and receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.